Well, good morning, everyone. So thankful for the opportunity to be able to worship together today. I do love a brass section uh, Sunday. It's one of my favorites. One of my favorites. Yeah, for sure. How many of you have some sort of a make-believe soundtrack uh, that's playing in the back of your mind all the time as you go through life? Am I the only one that has a make-believe soundtrack? Yeah, absolutely. And most of the time, there's a brass section in it. So like in the back of my truck, there's back there playing. I love it. If I'm pensive, it's the string section, but uh, typically pretty optimistic, so it's usually the brass. All right, if you are a guest, thank you so much for joining us today. My name's Jason, I'm one of the pastors here. I get the privilege to teach on the regular. Always thankful for the opportunity to do so. Uh, Matt said this maybe before some of you got in the room because uh, 83% of you show up after 11 o'clock. Uh, <laughs> now that we're tracking. Um, there's, a, there's guest services out in the commons today, uh, per like every Sunday, and they would love to meet you if you're our guest, answer any questions that you might have about our church family. Uh, we say it often, we mean it every time. We do realize there are many places that you could be this morning. And so we do not take it for granted that you're here with us, and uh, we hope that your heart and mind are encouraged as we make much of Jesus, which is always our desire when we gather together. Speaking of making much of Jesus, this is my first time teaching since we had our baptism Sunday a couple of uh, weeks ago, and I just wanted to say, I loved that day. It was absolutely encouraging. Loved everything about it. Yep. Story, story after story of grace and redemption and God's unfailing love and pursuit. Every story different with a common thread that runs through every one of the stories and that common thread is Jesus. Two, two things stood out to me on that morning that I wanted to point out to you just in case you missed it. One, the Lord continues to grow the ethnic diversity of this church family. And I believe it is more and more a reflection of the circle of influence in which we live and serve and live on mission. So I'm incredibly thankful for that. Secondly, Several of the strategic ministries that we have here at Fellowship Greenville, where the people of Fellowship, so many of you have jumped in to serve with no expectation of return. If you were listening as people were sharing their story, many of you have been a part of ministries here that have ministered to people and the Lord has used those ministry pathways for people to come to faith in him and grow in him. And so I'm incredibly encouraged by that as well. And before we jump into Galatians 4 this morning, based off of what I was just talking about, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Number one, who are you currently praying for by name that they would come to know Jesus? Or ask this way, who in your immediate circle of influence is close to you but far from God? Or maybe I could ask it this way. Is there anyone close to you that you think is out of reach of our loving Lord's gracious hand? These stories, these baptism stories, these stories of grace are just this constant reminder that God is calling a people to himself his vehicle to accomplish his mission of redeeming people is the church. And I pray that the Lord continues to bring people across our paths in which we can be the hands and feet of Jesus, that we would not grow weary in doing that, not be discouraged by those who have yet to say yes to him or think that they're too far away from the Lord. So here's what I wanted to do before we teach the scriptures. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes, and Take just a moment, whoever the Spirit brought to your mind, would you pray for them in this moment? That the Lord would redeem them in his time and that he would use you however he sees fit. Father God, whether it be family member, a child that you have entrusted to us, a neighbor, 
a coworker, a classmate, a roommate, a teammate. We stop this morning and continue to ask that you would do what only you can do in drawing people to yourself and to articulate once again in our own words in this moment of quiet prayer that we want to be used by you to make much of the gospel however it is you want to use us. And I pray for the no doubt hundreds of names that have just been lifted up in the last few moments that you would redeem them for your glory, for your fame. In Jesus' sweet name we pray, amen. Thanks for praying with me about that. I am so excited to pick up in our study through Galatians. If you've missed any of our messages, you can catch up online, YouTube, Spotify. We have heard that our app's not working today. I had no idea so many of you used the app before you came to church, so kudos to all of you that are doing that. My phone's been blowing up asking me about it. Uh, we do know that it's down. We got people working on it, no doubt about it, and so we'll get that up and running, but uh, you can listen and catch up in a lot of different ways at our website, YouTube, Spotify, whatever the platform you and the kids are using these days. If you're newer with us, uh, a quick backdrop since we're about halfway through uh, this study that we started in August. The apostle Paul had planted a church in Galatia and he had left and then some false teachers had come into the church and they started teaching like false teachers do. And, and here's what these false teachers were teaching. They were teaching uh, all about adding things to the gospel in order to be accepted by God, in order to be made right with God. The false teachers were saying this, believe on Jesus Christ, obey the law, and then you will be saved. But Paul had taught, believe on Jesus Christ and you will be saved and then you will obey God. You do obey God, but you obey God from a place of being accepted and loved in and through Jesus Christ. The motivation for obedience means everything. The false teacher said faith and obedience go hand in hand and the result is salvation. Paul said faith and salvation go hand in hand and the result is obedience. And from the beginning of this study, uh, back a few months ago, we have said this in, over and over again, Jesus plus nothing equals everything, and Jesus plus anything equals nothing. And so this morning, we turn our attention to the any things that equal nothing, or as I have entitled the message, empty idols. Now we need to acknowledge that we all have, we all have any things that keep trying to be our everything. Even though many of us willingly admit they never deliver, they actually can't be our everything because they weren't created to be our everything. And I think I've said this, this is my, I don't know, fourth or fifth time teaching in Galatians and I've, I've said it every time. I think, so I'll do it again today. I think we will get the most from our study through Galatians to the degree that we're willing to be honest about how we at times struggle with what the Galatians were struggling with and what Paul very emphatically and passionately was calling out. And today we see that Paul is reminding them, the Christians in Galatia, of the emptiness of idolatry or said this way, the law as a means to righteousness is an empty idol just like every other idol the world offers. Now, I wanna explain this a little bit more before we look at chapter four. The law as, as means to righteousness is an empty idol just like every other idol the world offers. Like that's not just a message for the church of Galatia back in the day. Truth be told, it very much applies to today, to the world we are living in. And honestly, it gets at the heart of what we say we're about as a church family. Think about this with me. We say that we desire that we exist. We are here in this geography as a Fellowship Greenville family, our mission statement, to reintroduce people to Jesus and the life that he offers. And for many of you, it is why you have landed in this church family. You have been reintroduced to Jesus and the life that he offers. 
Think about it this way with me. As we've been giving the backdrop of why Paul is writing Galatians, it actually has the exact same idea at the center of it. You could definitely say that Paul is attempting to reintroduce the church of Galatia to Jesus and the life that he offers. The false teachers are saying something different than what Jesus had said. And they're saying something different than what Paul had taught them when he was with them. He is reintroducing them. Now think about that where we live and do life, day in and day out. A geography where almost everyone has some sort of mental image of who Jesus is and what Christianity is all about. But any kind of research or just intentional listening on your part lets you know that the great majority of people in this area, the upstate of South Carolina, both inside and outside the church, define Christianity as living according to rules and regulations. Being good, doing right, not sinning. That is the way that most people think of faith in Jesus Christ. And that does not sound like the good news that Jesus showed up proclaiming. For most people, being Christian or deciding if you want to be a Christian centers around trying harder to live by certain rules and rituals, to earn our way into God's good graces. And our law keeping to prove ourselves, it shows up in a lot of subtle ways. It shows up in how we try to prove our righteousness to God, but it also shows up in how we try to prove our righteousness to other people. It even shows up in how we try to prove our righteousness to ourselves. Now, just a heads up. Um, today is maybe a bit more reflective than you might be used to on a Sunday morning. Here's what I mean by that. Um, the passage we're in is not overly complicated to process or understand. It's not. You'll see that momentarily. But it, it has a whole lot of room for intentional thought and reflection and listening to the Holy Spirit. Uh, I've been attempting to do that as I've studied this week and as I have been doing that for myself, I've been praying it for all of us this morning that we would listen to the Spirit as we engage the word. So just a heads up, on the front end and the back end of our time together, there are some real practical things that I'm going to call us to, to think about. So let me, to begin with, give you a few thoughts to consider to help you identify if your attempted righteousness is an idol at times. Sound good? All right, I'm just going to kind of read through them. We'll pause. But once you think about it, all right, here we go. Do you ever find yourself thinking, God won't bless me today because I've let him down. God will answer my prayers today because I've been good. I need to make it up to God because I've sinned. Or do you ever find yourself thinking, I need to clean myself up so God will accept me. Do you feel the need to make sure people know about the good things that you're doing? A few others. Are you regularly defensive? As in, you find it difficult to receive feedback about any weakness in your life or sin in your life. Uh, when confronted, your tendency is to explain things away or talk about your successes, or justify your decisions. You might be wondering, Jason, is there any tell that would help me know whether or not this is me? Uh, here'd be one. Um, people are hesitant to approach you, and you rarely have conversations about difficult things in your life. Are you a faker? As in, you strive to keep up appearances, maintain a respectable image, 
tell little white lies so that people will think better about you. Your behavior to some degree is driven by what others think of you or what you think they think of you. Maybe you don't like to think reflectively about your life and as a result, not many people know the real you. And if you're honest, maybe you don't know the real you that well either. Are you a hider? You tend to conceal as much as you can about your life, especially the bad stuff. This is different from faking it, as faking is about impressing other people. Hiding is more about self-shame. You hide because you don't think people will accept you or love you if they know the real you. Just a couple more. Uh, I actually had couples coming up to me in between services saying that their ribs were bruised because they were elbowing each other the whole time I was going through said list. It's pretty great. Are you an exaggerator? You tend to think and talk more highly of yourself than you ought. You make things, whether it's good things or bad things, out to be much bigger than they usually are, and the motivation behind that is to get attention. As a result, things often get more attention than they deserve and have a way of providing either sympathy or make people think that you're pretty spiritual. Are you a blamer? You're quick to blame others for sin or circumstances. You have a difficult time owning your contribution. There's an element of pride that assumes it's not your fault and or an element of fear of rejection if it is your fault. And lastly, are you a down player? You tend to give little weight to sin or circumstances in your life as if they are normal or not that bad, especially when you compare yourself to other people and their sin. And as a result, things often don't get the t attention they deserve. They have a way of mounting to the point of feeling at a certain point overwhelming. The idolatry of law righteousness shows up in our desire to impress God or impress others or impress ourselves. And Paul says, the law as a means to righteousness is an empty idol just like every other idol the world offers. And that is what the church of Galatia, Christ followers in Galatia, needed to hear. And I personally think it's what we need to be reminded of today as well. So Galatians 4, verse eight, I'll read through verse 11, this is what it says. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, you can turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more. You observe the days and the months and the seasons and the years. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. That's it. That's the text for this morning. Now, if you look at verse eight, you will see Paul say, you are enslaved to those that by nature are not gods, which leads to this question, if I'm you and if I'm me, what are the non-gods? So in this culture, the pagans or those who didn't know the true God believed behind everything, everything, there was a God. Earth, fire, sun, sex, war, agriculture, everyone had their own God. So there is a sea God and a sun God and an agriculture God and a fertility God. And Paul says anything can be worshiped and be the basis of your religion, whether making money or your sexual identity, or farming, or nature all around us, you can worship any of it, and all of it, and many people do. That at its core is idolatry. And Paul is reminding these folks that there really are only two options out there when it comes to worship. And these are your two options. Jesus, or idolatry, that's it. Maybe I could say it this way, nobody is an unbeliever. 
Nobody. You either believe in the true God or you are a slave to worshiping something that you treat as a God that isn't God. Now you might say, I don't believe in anything. Okay, that's your God. We're all made in the image of God, those that know God and those that don't. And sin has separated all of us from God and left in us a God-sized crater that only God can fill. And people spend their life cramming anything and everything in that God-sized crater. That is idolatry. Like I said, not new news for most of you here today. Maybe for some of you, you've never thought about it before. You've never heard anybody talk about it before, but okay. But I think this is the huge reminder in all of, a, in all of this, even for those that have begun a friendship with God and put God in his rightful place in our lives, just like the church of Galatia. We are still tempted and sometimes give in to the temptation of putting other things in God's place. That is also idolatry. And it is a constant temptation. And I believe something we should regularly be asking the spirit of God to point out to our heart and our mind as we live our life. Or said this way, it's, it's one of the ditches we can so easily run into even as a follower of Jesus is living this performance based off of our perceived morality, thinking that God will accept us more or love us more or like us more. And remember, there's a really big difference between believe on Jesus Christ, obey, and then you will be saved versus believe on Jesus Christ and you will be saved and then you will obey. It was Martin Luther who basically said, idolatry is always the reason we do anything wrong or sin. The first two of the 10 commandments are all about idolatry. If you've forgotten or unfamiliar, one and two, you shall have no other gods before me, one. Two, you shall not make for yourself any carved or graven image. Let's do the rest. Three, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not cover, covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor neighbors. Luther said, if you break any of the commandments three through 10, it's because you have first broken the first two in regard to idolatry. Unless we think that's just a thought for people in Old Testament times, let's flip it to the New Testament. First John 5 21 says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. This is the last verse of 1 John, and, and I know we're not teaching through 1 John, but, but the big idea of 1 John is all about living in the light and in the love of God. It's all about living a holy life in the world and how to be a loving person and how to walk with God. And then the last verse, John says, keep yourselves from idols, amen. And just in case you're wondering, this is the first time that idolatry has been talked about in the whole five chapters of 1 John which means there's only two possibilities. Possibility number one, John decided to throw something in at the last minute. And by the way, keep yourself from idols, okay, bye. Or maybe, just maybe, the whole thing was about idolatry and the last sentence is a summary statement. John is saying that if you and I ever fail to live in the light or the love of God, it is because we have idols in our life. A pretty famous older pastor named Dr. Lloyd-Jones said, John is teaching us the greatest enemy that confronts us is not of deeds or action, but of idolatry. Which leads to this question, how does this play out in our attempted righteousness? Well, some of, some of you Maybe it's based on background, church world that you grew up in. I'm not mocking it, but I do want to speak to it. Some of you above all else think that you need to be warned 
what not to do and what to do. That's what you think the Christian life is all about. It's why some of you have gone to church for years. Pastor Jason, Pastor Charlie, Pastor Jim, remind me again of what I should be doing and what I shouldn't be doing. Give me that bad list of things to stay away from and the good list of things to do. Why would John take the time to say, keep yourself from idols? It's because he knows what we know. There are constantly any things tempting us to be our everything. So can I reread the verses to you again from Galatians 4? This is what it says. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. But now that you've come to know God, or rather be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Do you hear it in Paul's voice? for these Christ followers in Galatia? Paul says, you were slaves to the pagan idols of your city and culture before you came to Jesus, before you accepted the truth of the gospel. And now you wanna follow all the law to be accepted by God and go back to being enslaved? Have I been wasting my breath with you? Let me make this point really quickly because I think it's important. When Paul says here in verses 10 and 11, you're observing the days and the months and the seasons and the years, the Jewish calendar, I'm afraid maybe I have labored over you in vain. This real quickly. Paul is not saying that Jewish rituals were evil or legalistic in and of themselves. I wanna make that point. Paul's not anti-ritual. You can read through the gospels. You got baptism, you got communion, you got coming together to worship together on the regular. But hear me, please hear me. These things are for the sake of worship not from a place of fear or displeasing or earning something from God. I am so glad you're here today. Matt alluded to it at the beginning. I don't know what your motivation is for being here, but I wanna say it since we're talking about it in this moment. You being here today earns you nothing from God. You know that, right? He's not more pleased with you. You are not more accepted in him. To come, to, to come together and worship? Yeah. Jason, it says in the Bible, don't forsake them. Yeah, 100%. What's the motivation in being here? He doesn't have a tally list up there. Are they there? Today? All right. And the week before Thanksgiving, pretty impressive. If they show up next Sunday, two points. The church of Galatia, before coming to know Jesus, they were Greek pagans. Here's what that means. That means they were party people. It means they were living it up. They were really worshiping idols and they were trying to appease those idols. What are they being tempted by in this moment that Paul is writing? The false teachers have said, if you really want to be accepted by God, it's not enough to believe in Jesus. You must be moral and obey everything in the law to be accepted. Become more moral and Jesus will accept you. Now hang with me, based off of their background of appeasing the little g gods of the day, it's not a stretch for them to now be thinking based off of what the religious leaders are teaching. Yeah, 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 yeah. We must appease God by keeping the law. This is why Paul is so fired up. The little g God idol worship was about appeasing the God who was angry. The agriculture God, I gotta keep him okay with me so I can have my crops. The sea God, I need to keep okay with me so he doesn't wipe us out with a typhoon or a hurricane or that it will rain and we can have the crops. So it's not a stretch to go, that's right, I gotta keep God happy with me by obeying the things. 
So Paul's saying, I know you were living promiscuous and sleeping around and offering sacrifices to the liturgy gods, and now you're thinking about following a strict moral law. Well, guess what? From God's perspective, those things are same. They are both idolatry. Paul is saying being moral for the acceptance of God is just as enslaving as the way the ways of the world had you deceived and in bondage. Or maybe I could say it this way. You can make an idol out of your work, your family, your money, and in doing so refuse grace and attempt to be your own Lord and Savior. Or you can become incredibly committed to religious rule keeping and in doing so refuse grace and still attempt to be your own Lord and Savior. It's the exact same thing. You're just as enslaved. Jesus himself drives the same point home when he tells that familiar story of the prodigal son in Luke 15. If you've never read it, give it a read this week. A father had two sons, one who squandered everything on crazy, wild, sinful living, one son who was incredibly moral and loyal. The younger brother living it up, eventually finding himself in the pig pen, no place to truly rest. The older brother, well, he was righteous, he did everything right, But listen, both brothers were actually attempting to control their father and both brothers were lost. The difference is the younger brother comes to a place of realizing his lostness. The older brother never does. Or as Tim Keller is known for saying, It is possible to avoid Jesus as savior as much by keeping all the biblical rules as by breaking them. And here's the thing. Uh, It's just so, it's so sneaky. The temptation that you need to prove yourself to God or that you need to prove yourself to others or you need to prove yourself to yourself. It's not a one-time thing that you put to death. I think it sneaks up all the time, this idea that you have to earn it. And that's why I'm asking us to do the heart work today and listen to the Spirit. How many of you have ever seen the movie uh, Saving Private Ryan? Show of hands, a lot of us. Okay, yeah, okay. I wanna talk about the movie for a second. So it's been out for a while. So if you haven't seen it, I'm gonna go ahead and ruin it for you. All right, just wanna let you know. I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. And if it's, well, this is a holiday break, I was gonna watch Saving Private Ryan. I don't believe you. So (laughs) there's that. They do, in fact, save Private Ryan. That's the, I need to let you know. They actually do, they get him, they get him. But if you remember the movie, towards the end, uh, you got Tom Hanks as he dies. Tom Hanks dies at the end, sorry. So two things, real quick, yeah. They save Private Ryan, Tom Hanks dies. All right, it's out now, you know. That's Cliff Notes. And as Private Ryan comes over, Tom Hanks calls him in close. Do you remember the scene? He calls him in really close and he whispers two words into his ear. Earn it. Earn this. It's like the climactic point of the movie. Yeah. But think of how paralyzing that is that someone just gave their life for you and then they whisper to you, go earn this. This is the beauty of the gospel. 
He has never once whispered in your ear, earn it. Never once. And some of you, based on your background and how you've grown up and where you've grown up, maybe because of what some other pastors and teachers have said, maybe because of what your parents said, maybe just the enemy himself whispering in your ear, you think you have to earn something that Jesus Christ gave his life for. It has been earned. It's free. How, yeah. How does this show up in our lives? There's lots of ways uh, if we're willing to look and sit before the Lord and and let him point it out, this moral righteousness that kind of bleeds in. I love Jesus, but also I've been doing this pretty well. I want to recommend a book to you. We have a shot over here. There we go. The Gospel-Centered Life. You're looking for something good to read? Pick it up. Read that over break while watching Saving Private Ryan. <clears throat> They're doing pretty good. They got over 100,000 copies sold, evidently. So it's a good one. It's not just, uh, it's, it's not a bad one. In this book, he talks a little bit about different ways that moralistic righteousness can kind of sneak in if we're not paying attention. Some of the things I asked you on the front end of the message uh, also uh, from this book. I'm a, I'm a big fan. So I just want to read. These are going to be on the screen for you. I want to read a couple of these to you. And uh, I'm just going to put them out there and then we'll kind of go with it. It's pretty tense in here today. I get it. So, all right, here we go. You ready? Number one, job righteousness, which says... I'm a hard, honest worker, so God will reward me. Hold on before we go to the next one. These are all uh, on the app and will be available to you sometime between now and the end of 2024, evidently. So you don't have to write them all down. We can get them out to you if you're interested. Or you can just buy the book. A lot of them are in the book. I added a couple of my own. I think you'll know when I added some of my own or I'll point it out to you. Here's one, family righteousness. Because I do things right as a sibling, child, or parent, and I have a good family, I get points with God. I'm more godly than parents who can't control their kids. What about theological righteousness? I have good theology and can, you know, accurately explain it because I'm right. God prefers me over those with bad theology. We could do church righteousness. I go to a good church, they get it right. Certainly one that is better than most others I'd know. So I get to look down on the other churches, be passive aggressive with them or even have pity on them and God agrees with me too. Let's do intellectual righteousness. I am more well read, more articulate, more culturally savvy than others, which obviously makes me superior to them in some way, shape or form. What about schedule organized righteousness? I am self Disciplined and righteous and rigorous in my time management and organized, which makes me more mature than others. Flexibility righteousness. In a world that's busy and people become slaves to their schedules, I'm flexible, relaxed, I always make time for others like Jesus because he was obviously a nine on the Enneagram. Shame on those who don't. It's a joke. This is not a statement about the Enneagram one way or another. I was just trying to be kind of funny. And most of you, if you're into the Enneagram, think Jesus was whatever your number was. So <laughs> you can make that point. What about this one? Mercy, justice, righteousness. I care about the poor and the disadvantaged the way everyone else should. And not only that, I stand up for them. I know Jesus sees me. I have a special place in his heart. Legalistic righteousness. I'm more concerned about holiness than most people I know. I do a fantastic job of keeping all the rules. Financial righteousness. I manage my money wisely in order to stay out of debt. I'm not materialistic or someone who can't control my spending. Or you could think about it this way. I have less money and clothes that aren't as nice as others, but I'm content and humble. Or you can think about it this way. I have these things because we've made good decisions and other people haven't. This will be a fun one for everybody. Political righteousness. You cannot be a real Christian and support a certain party and or candidate or what has become increasingly out there for people to take real pride in is I am apolitical. Not the, not the donkey or the elephant for me. I follow the lamb. 
right? I know, I get the sentiment, I get the sentiment. It's fun to tell the difference between the two services. First service, thought that was hilarious. This service, I might be getting some emails. Anyway, <laughs> tolerance righteousness. I'm open-minded and charitable toward those who don't agree with me. Protestant penance righteousness. No one feels worse about their sin and failures than I do. Guilt and shame are in my DNA and they motivate me to be better than ever Let's go worship righteousness. All I wanna do is worship. I raise my hands higher. I bow down lower. I sing louder, cry harder. So God definitely favors me. I can't believe everybody around me is not doing what I do. And this is just for the upstate of South Carolina. Sports righteousness. Our coach proclaims to be a Christian, so we win championships. Obviously, God is more pleased with my team. So just let me say it again. To the degree, to the degree that we're willing to acknowledge we struggle at times with an inner or outer attitude of performance-driven morality for God to accept us or be impressed with us or others to accept us or be impressed with us or for us to accept ourselves or be impressed by ourselves, to the degree the Spirit of God will meet us and lovingly, I think, point out our idols, remind us of who we are in Jesus Christ. I mean, one thing to pay attention to right there would be as I went through the list, which one kind of got under your skin? Which one did you begin to justify pretty quickly? Yeah, but. Pay, I'm just saying when we sit before the Lord and ask the Spirit of God to speak to us, I think a fair question to ask after our time together this morning, how can I be free from my idols? And I think there's two different groups of people. I think there are those of us that know Jesus. I'll talk to you in just a moment. I think there are folks here today who have never met Jesus and you're wondering about how you can break free from your idols. And this is what I would share with you. There is no idol that currently sits on the throne of your life that died for you so you could find life. As a matter of fact, that idol that you're giving yourself to, that anything that is offering to be your everything will actually lead to your death. And in an ironic twist, What God has offered you in the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, is the only hope for your idol-making heart. God is the only one that has made you this promise while you're looking for life and things that will ultimately lead you to lose your life. God says, I will give the life of my son Jesus so that you actually find life. So whatever your things are, you know your things are different than other people's things, but it's really not unique to you. If you don't know Jesus and you're running after other stuff, the things you're running after, at some point in time, other people have run after those things as well, people that have found and met Jesus. So whatever that thing is that keeps promising you your worth and your validation and you matter. A lot of us in this room have chased after that stuff and we know eventually you'll discover that it's empty. And our prayer for you would be, and maybe somebody prayed your name at the beginning of this service today. Today would be the day that you hear from Jesus that your idol is an empty idol. And if you want Jesus in your own words today, you can tell him, I'm tired of chasing after all these other things to define me. I realize that God's the one who created me. So why would I think all these other things that have been created would be the thing that could save me instead of the one that created me? 
You can tell him now you start walking with Jesus today. If you are a follower of Jesus and wondering how do I grow in identifying and acknowledging when I'm attempting to be moral enough to earn something from God because it creeps in, it's so sneaky. How does the truth of the gospel replace every idol that shows up in my life? The answer is actually in the verses we're looking at today. Look back at verse nine, if you would. It'll be on the screen. But now that you have come to know God, or rather, to be known by God, that's it. The word rather can mean more importantly, so let me read it to you again with more importantly there. How can you turn back to idols since you know God and more importantly, you're known by God? That's it. I don't know what kind of formula you were looking for if you were looking for a formula, it's not a formula. God knowing you is much more than God just being aware of you. To truly know someone is to enter into a personal relationship with them. Paul says over in 1 Corinthians 8 that anyone who loves God does so because God knows them. God knows you. So let me ask it again. How does God truly knowing you and loving you combat your idolatry? Richard Lovelace, he was a professor at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. He said it this way. It's a little lengthy, but it's good enough for us to consider as we close today. Christians who are no longer sure that God loves and accepts them in Jesus apart from their present spiritual achievements are subconsciously radically insecure persons, much less secure than non-Christians because of the constant bulletins they receive from their Christian environment about the holiness of God and the righteousness they're supposed to have. Their insecurity shows itself in pride a fierce defensive assertion of their own righteousness and defensive criticism of other people. They cling desperately to legal pharisaical righteousness, but envy and jealousy and other sin grow out of their fundamental insecurity. What's Richard saying? Why idols? Why the temptation at times to chase after morality as a means of being accepted and righteous with God, to think that he'll love you, like you more, because at times we are all very insecure in regard to God's acceptance of us. We hear from the enemy and from the world all around us the faint whisper earn it. And we either buckle down with our next best attempt that will, goes pretty well leading to our pride or doesn't go that well leading to our discouragement. Those are the only ways that it can go. So constantly trying to prove yourself to God or others or yourself, it leads to grabbing idols, anything, promising everything to, to firm up our self-image. Which by the way is, this isn't in my notes and I'm gonna go a little bit along. Like that is the message you are swimming in 24 seven. You realize this, right? Everybody's telling you to think that you are great. That's how you'll make it. That is the self-image world we are swimming in. All the while, the beauty of the gospel tells us that the God of the universe is proclaiming, I know you, I love you, I created you, I accept you, I'm for you, I sing over you, you are mine. And so that, that becomes the gospel message that we preach to ourselves every day. We let God speak it over us each day. And we let other people speak it over us on the days we have a hard time accepting it. And we speak it over other people on days that they have a hard time accepting it. And that is the church. That is this church. That is a community of grace. Will you pray with me? Father God, for the opportunity to 
take some time today and be reminded of who we are in you. We thank you. To once again have some space to contemplate the futility of the idols of this world and our own best morality to try to earn something with you from you. I'm just super thankful. And I do ask and pray that in the days to come, all of us here would carve out time to sit with you and hear from you. That we wouldn't be complacent, passive, as we constantly examine, is there any voice of earn it? And yes, Father God, that we would be a people that walk in obedience with you, but that each and every step of walking in obedience with you would be from a place of being loved and accepted and cherished by you. Continue to grow us into that community of grace. In Jesus' sweet name we pray, amen.